Excellent. And I'm just going to launch some polls for our attendees um, who have logged in already this uh, today with us just to get started. We just want to know a little bit about where you're joining us uh, from today. So take a moment and fill out the couple of polls that have popped up there for you. Tell us what province you're from. And then the second question is really about um, what it was that really drove you to join this session today. So what kind of interest in that second question, you can pick multiple questions, uh, multiple answers if you like. We just want to get a sense of who we're speaking to today and who has reached out to join us. Lots of great responses coming in here. Hey, Louisa. Hey, Rob. Was Hi. Hey. Great. I wanted to make sure your sound was working, so that's great. Lots of great responses coming in. All right, a couple of administrative things just before we get going while everybody is answering the polling. I just wanna let you know um, that there are ways for you to interact with us. Ideally, we would like uh, you to use the Q&A to ask questions. That will help our moderator uh, keep track of all the questions that are coming in in a little bit more orderly manner. You can also use the chat, um, but again, we do encourage you to use the uh, Q&A if at all possible. Um, again, like I said earlier, you won't be able to unmute or turn your camera on um, the, in terms of the webinar settings. That's the way we've set it up for today because we do have a lot of people who are joining in today. So we didn't want any risk of any background noise disrupting anybody's uh, uh, audio. And I see we're still getting uh, great responses coming in. A good number of people coming from Ontario um, and then a good chunk again from Alberta and Saskatchewan, a few from Quebec as well, which is great. And lots of different reasons why they're coming today. All right, well, before we get started with uh, introductions, I just wanna kind of cover off a couple of other things. Uh, in addition to using the Q&A to talk to us and ask questions, type the questions in throughout the conversation as things come up to you. Our moderator will help us to kind of keep that organized and we will try to get to as many questions as we possibly can uh, before the end of the hour. However, we will be sending out a summary of today's session as well. So if there's questions that we don't get to, we will do our best as well to communicate those back out to all of our attendees um, so that you can get the answers that you're looking for. The other thing I just want to say that today's session is about educational, uh, is, is an educational session. So we're not able to provide individualized treatment recommendations for you and your condition, unfortunately. Um, however, we hope that you'll find this information helpful and that you'll be able to um, hopefully reach out to a clinician um, close to you or vir through virtual care uh, to get the services or the help that you might be looking for as well. So again, just trying to be more uh, informative and sharing of our knowledge and experience uh, in this area. Excellent. So I think we've got lots of great responses, a few more coming in, but I would say Rob and Louisa, a big chunk of people from Ontario, which is not surprising given the, the volume of Ontario cases, sadly, that we're all living through, uh, but a good number of people also from Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Quebec. We're not seeing any other provinces just let yet. And a lot of people just love to learn, so they're here to learn about what we do, which is amazing. Um, but then an equal amount of people really just learning about what this rehab thing really means and looking for information for themselves as well. So I'm going to end that poll. Don't worry if you haven't gotten your responses in. We just wanted to get a kind of get a good uh, sense of, of who was with us today. So I'm going to stop my screen share as well because I had a couple of slides. Um, Oh, sorry, just trying to close that down going while we were chatting, but we're going to just stop that while we're going through our conversation. Oh, stop sharing. Uh -huh. Wrong button. There we go. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Minor technical difficulties. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Tom put in the chat, Ontario has the greatest cheddar cheese. I did not know that, Tom. That is amazing. <laughs> All right, well, we'll get started. So just a quick introduction. My name is Krista. I am today's moderator. Uh, I am a physiotherapist as well, um, but I'm a part of the, the corporate team at LifeMark, and I help to support our national roster of over 300 clinics across the country in offering programs like this one. So I'm really, really excited to be here and to see so many of you joining us tonight. Um, I have a couple of excellent, a couple of our excellent clinicians with us today, um, and they have graciously given them their time to come and share their knowledge and their experience in the area of working in post-COVID rehab. Uh, both of them have been seeing some patients since uh, really last summer um, and on through to now and increasing really over the last little while. 
So um, I'm just going to pass it off to Louisa. Do you want to just do a quick introduction of yourself? Sure. I'm uh, Louisa. I am a physiotherapist in Markham, Ontario. I've been practicing for about 11, year now, 11 years now. Um, and uh, I also run uh, the clinic for Markham Stokes post-operative rehabilitation program. Um, when I was in school, I loved to learn about cardiorespiratory therapy. Um, and in my clinical practice now, I have a really great passion for vestibular therapy as well. Great. And uh, Rob, do you want to just do a little introduction as well? Absolutely. So my name is Rob Tyndall. I'm an occupational therapist based in St. Catharines, Ontario. Um, yeah, I've been working with LifeMark now for nearly 11 years, so almost as long as Louisa. Uh, it's just on the tail end of that. So, uh, yeah, mainly working in, um, uh, well, with a wide variety of people and from motor vehicle accidents to workplace injuries and um, multiple different areas of, of treatment in terms of physical, mental, emotional um, treatment. Um, and it's just the best. I just love working with all my patients and, and the team at LifeMark. Great. And thanks so much for that. So yeah, today's session is really going to be all about this post-COVID rehabilitation program and what we know about uh, COVID. I will say that we all acknowledge that things have been changing fast and furiously in all areas around COVID-19 since we all began this journey just over a year ago. Um, but really, uh, we're here to share with you again our knowledge in this area. We've done a lot of work uh, over the last year, really doing a lot of research and trying to keep our clinicians up to date on what's going on in the rehab side of things but also um, to share with you what we've seen so far in the clinic when patients have come to see with us, come to see us. So um, hopefully you'll find it informative and then we will um, uh, kind of take some questions towards the end. So I just want to start off with a question to both of you um, and maybe Louisa, you can maybe go first is, can you tell us all a little bit about what we do know about this like post COVID long COVID whatever we want to call it, the symptoms after the acute virus has kind of run its course and people are considered kind of quote unquote uh, resolved or cured. Um, what do we know? Yeah, so, um, you know, at the uh, in, at this stage um, and uh, in, in our area of practice, well, what we find is with post-COVID, um, when they call you know, patients or label them as long haulers, they generally refer to those that may have these residual effects of symptoms um, that last longer than expected. Um, and they may have uh, recovered from a lot of the acute symptoms like fever, um, you know, severe headaches, um, and more acute symptoms like that. Uh, and then they're left with, uh, you know, um, deconditioning effects or fatigue and, and um, you know, it affects all different systems. So patients can present to us with one or even uh, many symptoms that are, um, you know, affect different parts of the body. So for example, you can have some symptoms that are coming from the lungs, you have, uh, you know, shortness of breath, um, symptoms that could be coming from the heart, where you have a racing heartbeat uh, that is either, you know, controlled or uncontrolled. Um, something as simple as deconditioning or, or um, very uh, fatigue, uh, you know, response to even simple activities like getting out of bed. Um, so, you know, that whole long hauler um, term um, is really those uh, symptoms that are sticking around longer than we expect, but are also, you know, affecting your daily function um, and, you know, causing impairment and, uh, you know, even affecting the way you're working or thinking um, and, and even simple things like, you know, um, ADLs, like taking care of yourself um, to, or to even other things like grocery shopping. So, you know, um, we tend to see a whole like array uh, and combinations of symptoms. You know, some clients can be coming to us with just one. Um, and then some clients can be coming to us with many um, and some that may not necessarily, you know, what is what we are trying to paint a picture as to what post COVID could be. Uh, you know, simple examples over the course of uh, taking on these clients since last year, um, they can range from, you know, a patient of mine who uh, is a sedentary desk work, uh, crunches numbers for an insurance company, um, you know, got, uh, got COVID and had some mild symptoms um, and recovered very fast, 
Um, but he was left with a little bit of deconditioning um, and he never really did a, too much exercise, but it took a, a bout of COVID um, and a bout of illness for him to kind of have this wake up call. So the reason why he called me um, and, and asked about our program is because he wanted to start conditioning. He knew that uh, there was already this underlying level of fitness and he wanted to get his act together. I saw him once. We went over all kinds of, um, you know, ergonomics and uh, basic exercises, cardiovascular training. Um, and with follow up, he said he was fine. and He was good with those exercises and he carried on. Um, we can see, you know, to the other spectrum, um, I've had a patient who his story was very amazing. Um, he had all the respiratory conditions, like, the, you know, very, um, he was on an, uh, a ventilator in the hospital for about six months, um, and they weren't too sure if he was going to make it. Uh, and lo and behold, he had a wonderful, you know, story. He got clapped down the hall um, and he was able to come away. So he was referred to me, in fact, by his family physician. The residual effect of his post-COVID was drop foot. So he presented like as if he had um, a sustained a stroke. Um, and so, you know, we try our best and we understand absolutely that the picture that every client paints when it comes to those long-term effects, um, you know, is very different. And so we appreciate, you know, the combination of things that can happen, um, a lot of out of the ordinary things that can happen that may not, you may not necessarily see when it comes to common uh, symptomology of what COVID can present. Um, and so, you know, we're able to address that and ensure that, if, you know, when you come for therapy, we can address all those specific concerns for you. That's great, Louisa, and really great examples of, you know, the variety of types of, of problems that people can have. Um, so, Rob, Louisa covered off a lot of the kind of physio or physical mm. related uh, symptoms, which we know are out there. But can you tell us a little bit about what kind of you know, symptoms might be relevant in the world of OT as relate to kind of COVID or what we know about this long COVID from your perspective. Yeah, for sure. So there's, I mean, a whole host of things as Louisa was alluding to that, um, you know, people may not have thought would be a result of, of, of COVID after the, we talk about, you know, the resolution of the actual virus. Um, things especially that have been brought up to me have been brain fog. So that's sort of a catch-all term that, that a lot of people will bring up and they'll, they'll use this brain fog terminology and, and people that are experiencing it may say like, yeah, you know, that really speaks to me, that term. And it really talks a lot about, um, you know, mental fatigue, difficulty with concentration, a lot of memory difficulties, sometimes it can present as confusion or jumbled thoughts. Um, and, and it's a really challenging thing for people to be going through. And that's definitely something that, um, you know, I've addressed through a whole host of, of other clinical populations. Um, so there's lots of methods to, to go about assessing that, uh, to find out a specific area of, of, um, uh, of treatment to, to go after, because as we recognize, everyone's an individual here and we're treating them very holistically. Um, but that's one area that's definitely been brought up with, with people that, with whom I've been working um, in, in this, in this post-COVID um, population. Um, other, other, you know, symptom presentations are definitely the mental health side of things. I mean, I think, you know, regardless of, you know, where we're at, um, a lot of us or all of us are dealing with some, you know, we'll call it an insult to our mental health status. I mean, regardless of if we've had a COVID diagnosis or not, but we're seeing it, especially in people that have, that have had a COVID diagnosis where, you know, there's some mood dysregulation, there can be some depressive symptoms, some anxiety symptoms. Um, and especially it can happen in people that had pre-existing mental health conditions. So we see an exacerbation of that with, with all of the different things that have been happening, a lot of fear and worry. So we were looking at that and, and trying to treat people, just going to adjust my blinds. <laughs> we're sorry about that. It's the real world. Um, so it's just, yeah, we see a lot of these, the mental health conditions sort of coming up and it's definitely something to, to talk about because we see a lot of people sort of suppressing some of that stuff because we should be, you know, quote unquote, should be better than this, but we all need support. And that's a, a big area of practice where occupational therapists come in. And, and it's, uh, it's, I mean, for me, it's a quite a satisfying area of practice because you can see results um, through the intervention. Um, I guess additionally, um, you know, from a psychosocial perspective and sort of to define that, we'll talk about you know, the, the impacts of relationships with people, the impacts of isolation, um, loss of sort of a feeling of, of control over 
our, our lives in general. Um, the manage, like I said, the management of isolation itself and, and our limitations and restrictions on our normal activities, um, socially, recreationally, um, and that sort of thing. So these are all areas where, you know, we work as a team, um, you know, physios, occupational therapists, kinesiologists as, as you know, multidisciplinary team to, to help people throughout the recovery. So that's, that's uh, a big one. Other ones that not specific to OT or physio necessarily that we're seeing that have been brought up, um, you know, some gastrointestinal symptoms that will arise. So yeah. um, that's definitely things that are brought up, you know, um, rashes, metabolic disruption. So that would be, you know, uh, challenges managing diabetes. Um, so these are things that we're seeing come up and, and definitely, you know, we can refer on to appropriate um, medical professional or other allied health professionals to assist. Um, um, I, I can add something to that too, because recently sure. I've uh, had a patient, like I worked with a lot of um, long-term disability clients who are post COVID um, or patients who have, may have um, uh, contracted COVID while at work. Um, and one of the biggest things, uh, not from a physiotherapy perspective, but even the attempt to, you know, plan something as, as to help them to go back to work. Um, the mm -hmm. one of the concerns was um, being able to integrate, you know, psychosocial factors, integrating back into the community and that stigma of I had COVID it's not a secret. People know I have it. You know, how, how will I be able to go back? How can I handle um, the response of interaction with, with people that I know, like even close, uh, you know, family members or, um, you know, coworkers that I've been working with forever, um, you know, they, they, even they will act weird around me. Like, how do I handle that? So I would Imagine that we cannot underestimate the discipline of occupational therapy as well as the psychotherapy um, services that we have that can help with even just dealing with the stigma of, of, of COVID, post-COVID. For sure. And I think you both made the point too, is that like, it's, you don't have to have, you know, um, had a COVID diagnosis to be no. feeling the effects of this, especially from the mental health side of things. But certainly uh, those that have had it have even had even more so like said to the stigma kind of piece of it so thanks so much for adding that in Louisa yeah so you both have talked a little bit already about some of the symptoms but can mm -hmm. we just cross off and maybe just list off kind of what are the most common symptoms that we know from kind of like literature and your experience um so maybe Louisa, Louisa I'll let you go first again like kind of what are the top you. Yeah, I mean, like they, uh, the usual top three is a, a general cough. Um, and usually we see those in like more acute stages. Um, I, you know, the cough, the low grade fever, um, you'll have a bit of difficulty with breathing. Um, in fact, that's a really, that's a really big one. Um, and then you can also have that generalized uh, fatigue. It's like, you know, being hit with the general flu, and then you're knocked on your butt for a few days. And wiped out um and and as you're trying to come back you have a tough time just you know trying to gather yourself and have that strength to even you know take a good shower for example so um those are usually the most common ones uh, the ones that are um you know other uh, other common symptoms can also be associated with maybe some underlying uh you know uh, conditions uh that uh, somebody can already have pre-existing, for example, like asthma. Um, one of my patients does have underlying asthma and she does experience this tightness of the chest more often um, than normal. So some of those underlying conditions are exacerbated by you know, the effects of what uh, COVID has kind of left behind. Um, the other um, symptoms that we can experience is headaches, um, more susceptibility to headaches. For women, um, I actually have a few clients who find that when they come around to their cycle, their symptoms are worse. Um, so mm -hmm. I was not able to, uh, you know, to kind of indicate or nor do I have access to such you know, studies of whether or not that, you know, there is a hormonal effect, you know, when it comes to that, uh, you know, the exacerbation of post-COVID symptoms. Um, other things, you know, musculoskeletal signs for sure. Um, 
the general fatigue. Um, there can also be some referral numb tingling and burning, just kind of like my, you know, uh, COVID patient that had the drop foot. He did experience like complete numbness on that one part from the knee down to his uh, left foot. Um, and just as uh, Rob was saying, you know, they break out in rashes. He did. He did experience um, this onset of rash. And he went back to the specialist. They're just like, it's COVID. You know, um, and so they did give him a topical ointment to try and it did clear up over about a week. Um, and so we were able to resume uh, treatment and, you know, so uh, as I may jump the gun here, but I just wanted to mention that we were very lucky, you know, to have, a, we have a wonderful um, online virtual care platform set up uh, where I was able to continue online. Um, and uh, be able to, you know, um, just to kind of keep up and monitor and, and make sure that he's compliant and doing his exercises. And then when he's ready to come in, uh, you know, then we're back in person. So that was really nice to see. Um, other, other than that, you're going to find like cardiovascular conditions, um, you know, the shortness of breath, um, the uh, racing heart. Bit. Um, so those are some common ones that I tend to see. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Louisa. Great, mm -hmm. you know, a, a broad list. We can certainly see how mm -hmm. it's definitely affected by the various different systems. Um, and Rob, I know that probably the fatigue is one of the top ones too that you work with um, as well, particularly, but can you tell us a little bit more kind of some of the symptoms that you've seen and, and being particularly prominent? Absolutely. So yeah, I, I would second a few of them. Um, obviously, like I've said before, you know, everyone's an individual in this situation, but the that chest tightness has been definitely reported across uh, several clients. Um, the, again, generalized fatigue, some sleep disorders. So some people will have you know, challenges falling asleep or staying asleep, returning to sleep um, at night. Um, you know, and that can be due to the fact that you know, their daytime energy, um, we'll call it, isn't being used up. So I, I, I liken it to um, you know, if we have a battery that's fully charged in the day, um, if we're not using the, if we're not using our energy, we may have a difficult time um, falling asleep because we don't, we don't need that charge up again. So that's one area where I've, I've really found a lot of successes around the topic of, we'll call it sleep hygiene or sleep education and, and, and that sort of aspect. Um, you know, other areas is um, a big time disruption in terms of just general ability to engage in people's personal care or their chosen um, you know, housekeeping or home maintenance types of activities. So if they, you know, had a normal routine of just simply doing the laundry or tidying up, it's those types of the energy deficits or, or lack of energy that, that won't allow people to engage in those chosen activities. So it's, you know, we see, we're seeing a lot of these things and, and people are definitely, um, you know, helpable. That's not really a, maybe a true word in the sense, but I mean, these are things that are, are are manageable we can we can hear the stories we can we can get a good picture of where that person is in, in the moment and and help them out um you know work through these things uh the other areas where we're seeing is cognitively so we're talking about memory attention concentration you know if someone's a, a reading fanatic and they sit down to read their favorite author and they're struggling to get through half a chapter without losing their attention um, that's something that I'm definitely seeing come up. And that again is, is amenable to treatment with different approaches. So it's something that can present as quite scary to people, especially if they've never had, um, maybe, maybe experienced something like a concussion and they, they resolve from that very similar in presentation. And we use similar approaches, um, through activity modulation, through sleep management, through actual cognitive, we'll call it cognitive remediation or cognitive compensation. So compensation meaning using things like lists or reminders and things like that, or remediation, meaning we're actually trying to so solve the core problem. So that could be using, you know, cognitive, we'll call them games or exercises to assist with, you know, attention training or, or sustained attention or, you know, visual or auditory memory. And it's, these are all things that we're seeing, but um, I feel like, you know, the professions that we have on our team here can really go after a lot of the symptom presentations in a very effective way. Um, and we've seen some fantastic results with the, with the clients coming through the door. 
Absolutely. I have to agree because, um, you know, working with my occupational therapist uh, with, uh, you know, those kinds of symptoms where they have that brain fog and concussion like symptoms, you know, as you know, for example, if Rob is working on those cognitive things, we can definitely transfer some of those, um, those tasks to physical tasks. Um, for example, if we have to do like there's some lightheadedness or dizziness with movement, we can incorporate a cognitive component, say, uh, for an eye tracking exercise as simple as tossing a ball up, and you're doing your three times tape, right, uh, as you're trying to keep your eyes focused on the ball. So we definitely can, you know, uh, change and ground with the level of uh, intensity for exercises um, and tasks to incorporate um, the, the different disciplines that you probably be seeing. Uh, and it takes care of many things at once and it's very effective and, you know, not time consuming, uh, nor should we feel like that as you receive treatment, you know, there is this collaborative care approach where um, we will have those discussions amongst each other um, when it comes to your allied healthcare professionals to discuss what are you doing with them? This is what I'm going to do. That's a great idea. I can definitely incorporate that into my practice as well for and their treatment regime um, so that we can cover those things and kind of always have this one step ahead. So by the time you go back to seeing Rob, you're like, I've already been doing that, right? Um, <laughs> And it, and it really does make this, uh, this efficient progress a um, uh, very positive experience um, and, and not so stressful at all. I like that in, in jumping into kind of talking a little bit about the multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach. And I think it really parallels a couple people are asking in the Q&A and we'll get to them, but about like getting back to work. And I think what you, yeah. the example you just gave there, we are not only physical beings or only cognitive beings, yes. right? We are we occupational be to... beings. We are occupational <laughs> we are, beings. Of course, the occupational therapist is going to pull that out. And occupation not being just work, right? So and, and Rob, maybe you can take a minute and a second and tell us a little bit what really occupation means in the world of occupational yeah. therapy. But like, you know, you need to be able to walk, talk, take in your environment, take care of your kids or your family or whatever is your kind of current scenario. So you really do you need a team or an approach where you can kind of incorporate those things together because you can start with just the cognitive, but you're never going to be back to normal if you only work on just cognitive or vice versa in terms of the physical. So just for a quick second, Rob, can you just yeah. tell us a little bit about what occupation means to occupational therapists? Because I know Absolutely. a lot of people think of that's a job. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, I'm a job therapist only. Um, no, but really occupational therapy. So we talk about, you know, an occupation is anything that occupies us. So we sort of define that in a few groups. So we can talk about self-care. We can talk about productivity, we can talk about leisure. Um, and, you know, we can break those down even further. So we talk, you know, I think self-care is maybe a, an overused term in terms of today's, you know, we talk about maybe having a hot bath, but really we talk about, um, you know, self-care in terms of one's ability to take care of ourselves across a whole host of things like that can be as simple as bathing and dressing and toileting and all those basic you know uh, daily functions but it can also be you know the act of self-care to actually you know you know fulfilling activities um, and that translates again into that leisure component as well so we you know recreation and leisure as an occupation so things that we choose to do with our time so that can be like I was alluding to before reading is something people find very passionate or playing music or playing sports or even just socializing with friends. So, um, and then we also talk about that productivity side. So we talk about work. I mean, even people who aren't um, maybe in the, um, the working world, either um, retired um, or, or other, um, they still are productive beings, right? We still want to feel productive in the things that we do. So that can be anything from the things we do around the house or volunteering in the community, um, you know, attending church and that sort of thing. These are all sort of things that, that people are, are lacking or missing in this, these sort of wild times um, due to either, you know, uh, lockdown scenarios, but also just because of our symptom presentations. So we try to take these, this holistic approach and make sure that people, um, you know, we're, I think at the beginning stages, we were sort of talking really about symptoms and really about how to manage those symptoms, but how do we translate that function, or sorry, how, how we translate the symptoms and the resolution of symptoms into function. So it's returning to being able to, you know, walk your dog or do your housekeeping or play with your kids or grandkids. And a big question a lot of people have is returning to work. So that's a huge, huge component where people go, 
okay, how do I do my job? And, you know, Louisa was saying, you know, working with the client who had a relatively sedentary job, meaning a job that doesn't involve a ton of physicality, lifting, carrying, pushing, pulling, but may involve a ton of cognitive demand. And even sustained positioning can be very challenging for people that, you know, aren't challenging the respiratory system on a regular basis. But on the other side of it, if you work in, say, a warehouse or your um, you know, factory or in construction or any job that involves some sort of physicality, we want to make sure that we're addressing that, uh, the strength component, the endurance component, uh, body positioning components. So these are all things that we would individualize care to. Um, and that's really assisting with finding out what the job is and what one's current capacities are and trying to bridge that gap as best you possibly can. And one thing that the interdisciplinary teams do, and I'm, I'm sure Louisa would agree with this, as well as Krista, is we really try to make a plan that is conducive to a gradual return over time, recognizing that someone might not be 100% prior to a return to work starting. And, you know, real life is therapy. So, so long as we have clearance, so long as we have the capacities to do the job safely and, and, and effectively, um, you know, the physiotherapist and occupational therapist and kinesiologist or psychotherapist, whoever's on your team, whoever's required to be on your team, are going to work together to return you to any and all of your occupational um, desires, really, whatever it is you need or want to get back to doing. Yeah. Yeah, I like that, that occupational therapist thing there. You just said, you know, that uh, life is therapy or, or right. Life is, real life yeah, is real, like real life is therapy, 100%. And I mean, yeah. I think that I think that real life is therapy. And I think that if we over, um, you know, complicate things or over medicalize things, it gets a little bit, you know, down in the dumps. But if we can engage people with the things that they are truly passionate about, or they find meaning and purpose in, that's where like that's where the games are made. And that's where I feel like, you know, the staff at LifeMark are really good at meeting people at their level. And I mean, and it's, you know, nothing against physios, it's, it's with, with, with occupational therapists, we get right into like, what does life mean to you? What, like, what matters to you? What are your goals? Because your goals become my goals and we're yes. gonna bridge that gap and we're gonna knock it out of the park every step of the way. And sometimes it's those bite-sized goals that eventually sort of balloon into this, like, okay, I'm starting to see some semblance of my full life again. And it's so amazing to see people that, you know, a, a great example, a client of mine couldn't go up his stairs. He was went from, you know, COVID diagnosis, you know, isolated in his basement, um, you know, from his whole family to getting the all clear to reintegrate back into his home. He couldn't get up the stairs to his own kitchen to eat with his family without having to like lay down on the couch prior to eating meal with family. So we, you know, started to bite size, you know, goals around, okay, we're going to start walking a little bit more, or we're going to start engaging in, you know, playing music, or we even, he decided he wanted to start organizing because he's a bit of a, uh, a keeper of things. So he, that was therapy for him because he wanted to get rid of stuff, but it was conditioning. So he sort of knocked two things out and he got right back into it and we started taking off and he's, he's back to work and he's, he's, he actually sent me a message the other day and said how um, he couldn't see at first going from that stage of not being able to get out of his basement to his kitchen to I'm back to a order picker position at a, at a retail facility and he's working 37 and a half hours a week and is able to do his chosen activity. So it's very encouraging to see these things and, and it's, it's amazing the power of a, of a team approach. Yeah, you know, and I'm pretty sure there's some that are listening who, you know, maybe listening to this nice, uh, you know, happy ending story um, and say like, well, you know, where my symptom is set that I have right now, I don't even think there's a way that I could go back. Like, For sure. A lot of the, the, the mentality when they start such a program where they're introduced even say, you know, third parties, uh, you know, insurance companies to say, look, you should try this. Well, I don't think I'm ever going to go back to my regular job. You know, our job as clinicians, uh, physios and OTs, uh, you're, you know, your interdisciplinary uh, team, you know, we're here to help you again, like Rob said, to find that perfect level of start. Um, but we're also, our job is definitely to establish your abilities, what you can do and what you can't do, or what you have a tough time doing. 
Um, and that's where we are your strong advocate uh, to your employer, um, to your insurance company, um, so that we can have you progress, uh, you know, return back in a meaningful, you know, positive, sustainable manner, um, uh, you know, so that way, it's also safe for you to, uh, you know, uh, transition back um, and in what capacity, right? So we are definitely here to, you know, help you identify the things that you can do, not what you cannot do um, and go from there. So um, mm -hmm. biggest, scariest answer is what if I can't go back to my regular, regular job? I want to, I'm really scared that I don't think I can do it. Well, we can definitely help to establish something to give you a better sense of what you know, what that can look like um, and potentially, you know, change your mind, so to speak. Um, you know, there are a lot of functional measures, like scientific clinical measures that we do do in the clinic um, that can paint an amazing picture, you know, um, and no offense to the OT stuff, but all emotions aside, you know, from a physical standpoint, exactly what it is that you're capable of without hurting yourself. Um, Right, and have those you know down on paper and in numbers, um, and to, to show where your start is. Um, and if you feel like you're falling off the train tracks as you continue with us, we show you where you started. Um, and in fact, you would be making a lot of gains. And so, you know, keeping track, uh, being the mad scientists that we are, um, we can definitely show you on paper, numbers don't lie, uh, that you are indeed progressing, even though you can, you know, fall into this roller coaster ride of feeling, um, you know, terrible one day, pretty good the next day, and then pretty good mm. another day, terrible another day. But this is what happens when it comes to that progression. Um, and so, you know, we're here to see you through that. So you guys have both hit on a couple of really great points through this whole interaction. And I'm going to go to a couple of questions from the Q&A that are relevant to it. One is kind of around the return to work. And so we've kind of started to talk a little bit about that. Like, what are you guys seeing in terms of graduated return to work? Is it weeks? Is it months? And you, the particular person is saying, you know, what about these like the random good days, the random bad days that it seems to be being experienced by a lot of people, um, especially with kind of more of that fatigue presentation and the overexertion or so the exertion resulting in kind of that over fatigue. Can you talk, it's going to be individualized. I know that's always the physio and OT yeah. default we like to go to is it, it depends. depends. Um, it depends. But, what, what are you seeing right now, it, it, practically? Again, no, everybody has to realize this is not a prescription, but just generally. Um, okay, from a physio perspective, you know, we can talk about this now before a client even starts. You know, we usually have to propose some, some recommendation or anticipation as to how long we think, um, you know, this, uh, this gradual return to work program is going to look like, um, you know, and it is, it is individualized. It's also based on how people respond to the functional, you know, treatment program that they're engaged in, right? So, so there's two questions. Uh, how long is the, does a program last for? That really depends on your situation, your work situation. Um, how long is a gradual return to work program? In, in general, uh, I, I see about six to eight weeks. Um, it, and it also, it also depends on whether or not the employer can, can accommodate that. So there has to be this, uh, you know, nice communication between the third party plus the employer, um, you know, as we identify your abilities and your restrictions, uh, whether or not uh, that can be doable, right? This is, what, this is what Joe can do. And these are some things that he has a tough time with. Do you have job available where he can start um, and gradually progress? whether it be based on time, um, whether it be based on your duties, because a lot of uh, duties, you cannot change their duties, right? For example, like uh, even say, for example, like a, um, an ICU nurse, it's not like they can pick and choose what they wanna do, um, but we can definitely help to endorse, you know, a modified hour for how long they do it, uh, incorporating micro breaks and things like that for pacing. Um, so those would definitely be advocated for, um, for the patient. Uh, and the worker. So, you know, it, it's going to range. Um, it can go for uh, from a few weeks uh, to just a, to a few months, and then depending on how you fare uh, with the gradual return and the feedback is important. And I find what a lot of my patients um, have been quite successful with. I've only had I, I have to say I've only had a few um, where they you know were not success, successful in returning. 
or they had kind of stuck with the modified duties that we were recommending. Um, the biggest thing that I really push for is I want to see a patient go back during their time with me which means as they return, we are supporting their transition to ensure that it is uh, sustainable, it's not dangerous based on you know, what we're recommending and how it kind of looks on the patient side. right? Um, when the client knows that they have us to back them up, the confidence comes in as opposed to just finish your, your treatment regime and then go on, let's go, let's see what you can do. Right? Whereas I want to be there for at least the last two weeks of their treatment regime, I want them to see, I want to see them go back while they're with me. So that way they go to work, they come back and say, Lou, you know, I, I totally forgot that this was a part of my job. Like I had to do this one thing and it, and it killed me. It was really hard to do. Can we like, can we problem solve, figure it out? Like before I go back next time, like what is it I can do better? Uh, and that, that's one of the main reasons is that they're not so afraid, um, you know, to try knowing that they still have us um, to support them. So from a physio's perspective, I think that, um, uh, that uh, that's very, very effective. Um, and a lot of the times the transition back to whatever it is they are going back to, it's pretty successful. Bob, do you have anything you want to add into that? I got a couple more questions yeah, I, here I want to throw at you yeah, guys. Yeah, but... 100%. percent I'll, I'll try to be brief with this one. But the return to work is definitely a, a, a heavy one for people because a lot of people are are hurting. They need to get back to their jobs. Um, but the big piece is, again, the communication one that, that Louisa was um, mm -hmm. alluding to. Um, you know, communicating with an employer to find out, do they have something called like a physical demands analysis to, for their job so we can compare one's abilities uh, that we're seeing clinically to the job and then we can broach the subject of uh, modified duties um, and, you know, uh, either virtual or, or sometimes on-site uh, job coaching to assist people with sort of relearning job demands or, or engagement in specific tasks, um, sometimes even, you know, suggesting ergonomic changes to environment or, or, or process changes um, that may not only help the, the person that, with whom we're working, um, but uh, may also help other people in that job environment as well. So it com really comes down to communication. And I know it's sort of the it depends response is our tendency, but it really does depend on um, the physical and or cognitive demands to which you're returning and the impacts of your, your current status. So, um, but it is encouraging, as Louisa was saying, like we do, we are seeing quite a lot of success with our programs with, you know, activity uh, regulation, improving conditioning, improving cognition. Uh, for people getting back to work. And, and, and the big thing is going back to work and staying back at work. That's what we're really going for. It's not a one and done. It's we want you to go back and stay back and be super successful and go in your merry little way and live the amazing life that you're entitled to. So that's what we're, that's what we're going for. That's great. Uh, thanks. So yeah, that definitely crosses off a couple of key questions that we're asking by the, the crew out there. So uh, I'm going to shift gears slightly because again, there's a couple more questions in this area and um, it's kind of around the, these other syndromes that seem to be, you know, coming out in the literature and we're hearing patients talk about um, as being a result of or developing after COVID or as a result of COVID. Um, so things like, you know, we're seeing post-viral fatigue, um, things, these post-exertional malaise the POTS, so the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, um, the chronic fatigue syndrome. So, you know, I know you guys know about these things because one, I know that we've done some extra training and reminding of everybody what these conditions are, but what do we know about those and how do they impact rehabilitation? So uh, maybe Rob, I don't know, do you, or Lisa, do you want to start? I don't I know. Start. I can start with those. You know, those terms, uh, yes, uh, those conditions do exist. Um, and when you say it, it's a uh, very intimidating, sure is. Um, however, it's not something that, I, you know, the my colleagues in our, the allied health professional world um, is not familiar with. Uh, you know, even as a, a concussion therapist, you know, we are going to see the, that exertional fatigue, um, uh, you know, difficulty with uh, resistance uh, or tasks that require resistance. 
Um, you know, and these are all very good things. If, if the, you know, your family physician uh, or specialist has identified these types of syndromes, um, for me as a physiotherapist, it's perfect to know. And I, and I, I love to know about uh, that um, because it does help to drive, you know, the approaches to how I can, you know, create this reactivation program for you as an individual, right? So for example, let's just say, um, you were officially diagnosed with uh, the POTS, um, the postural or systatic tachycardia, um, and you have a tendency for your heart rate to rise uh, very fast, uh, even in resting, um, you know, upon assessment, for example, or even if I was to do, you know, part of my physical examination, um, I would be hooking up, you up to a, a heart rate monitor just to see how that, um, you know, that behaves, your heart rate behaves when I put you through a few different levels of um, exertion. Um, and so, you know, we can use that as a gauge and we can always use the, this device to, you know, monitor your response um, with every treatment if I have to, right? So for example, I, I did have a long-term disability patient. Um, she was a, a personal support assistant at the hospital and she did, um, she was diagnosed with COVID. Um, and, you know, uh, the biggest thing is I did the virtual assessment. However, you know, given that she was diagnosed with the POTS, I ensured that the rest of our treatment uh, or the assessment component, the functional uh, component um, was done in person so that I can monitor her heart rate, um, her oxygen level um, and blood pressure as well, just to see how she fares, uh, you know, with, with the functional piece. So, so we definitely have the means to, um, you know, record those things uh, and keep track of them. Um, you know, nowadays with the, all the apps and things like that, it's very easy to, you know, create a file for a patient and show, look, this is what your heart was doing, you know, before, this is what your heart is doing now, um, and have some good comparison, good numbers to, to uh, demonstrate. That's great. Thank you. Rob, did you want to jump in about kind of some of these other syndromes and, and what does that mean to you uh, in terms of rehabilitation? Yeah, I think it comes down to I mean, the individualized component is finding out, you know, what, where this person is at and, and, you know, talking a little bit about the psychosocial stuff or the cognitive issues that are going on. I mean, they come, you know, right hand in hand with a lot of the, uh, the diagnosis that we we're, we're talking about or these syndromes we're talking about. Um, it's, it's a very interesting area of practice, but I mean, when we start talking about brain fog, or when we start talking about some of the, uh, the impacts of, of uh, other areas of cognition, um, there are some fantastic ways of approaching it. Um, and it, it, I see some of the questions coming in as well, talking about, um, you know, challenges with memory or challenges with reta retaining information. So, you know, the big part is starting off with um, some compensation. So getting people to actually um, be successful with, with their daily function through those, those, you know, reminders or tracking or planning and pacing, that sort of thing. And then we start working on the specific deficit areas uh, with cognition. So we start doing things and I try to, we'll call it gamify uh, some of these uh, cognitive games so that they, they are you know, more fun to do. Yes, they will be very challenging. That's part of the, part of the task, but um, you know, we, we will grade it up. We'll make it you know, very um, acceptable in terms of the challenge level at the beginning, and then we'll challenge you as, as um, things go on. And, it's very similar to what we would do from an activity uh, management perspective um, on the on the physiotherapy side. Yeah, and and you know when it comes to establishing a, a, a regime, a reactivation regime for each patient, you know, we we as clinicians can use evidence based outcome measures. Uh, that can help uh, set you a, a, at a certain level. Um, but what's really important about those measures is that there are some that are designed um, to include you uh, in your treatment. Like what, what, is, what do you want your treatment regime to look like? So something as simple as a you know, patient specific functional scale, for example, something that we do use in the clinic a lot because it is um, uh, it is individualized oriented uh, to you um, and it also holds you accountable, right? So, you know, the, the, the scoring for something like that, for example, is what are, so, what have, what is, uh, what are a few things that um, you did uh, before, you know, being diagnosed with COVID um, that you want to go back to? Um, and it's based on a minimum of three goals uh, and then you score yourself out of 10, 10 being I can do it 
problem, zero means I cannot, and you can give yourself a score. So as we go through the treatment regime, because this is also your personal functional goals, we keep these into consideration as we progress you. Um, and when you do have a down day, you know, I'll bring that out for my patient and be like, look, this is where you're at. Tell me how you feel now. Right. Um, just to kind of keep you on the train tracks and remind you of those motivational things that you established yourself, um, you know, so that we can push you along. Um, so, you know, we, yes, we, we definitely have a lot of tools. We definitely have a lot of, uh, you know, strategies that can help you to get better. But we also need you to tell us how you want to get better. Um, and so we do have that science based, uh, you know, measurements to do that. Um, but for sure, you know, it, it, it takes a, a team and not, you know, the team includes the patient. For sure. That's great. And, and like I said, you know, I kind of hear you guys talking, you know, these, these conditions and then Louisa, you said, it's great if we know that diagnosis, but yeah. it's also, you know, what I hear you guys talking about is just that individualized nature. Like you look at, we're looking at the person, what their problems are, what their current level is and where they want to go. And then trying to build the roadmap between those two points. And it might be, it might have some detours along the way. Um, but, you know, trying to do the best to kind of really start where you are and, and try to help you guide you back to, to where you want to be. So that's really great. So uh, there's lots of so many great questions. So I want to get there and we're already like burning through our time, which is amazing. Um, I know. Um, but I want to talk, uh, Rob had a chance to talk a little bit more about what OT kind of does, but I want to talk and, and a couple people have asked the question is like, what can physiotherapy do to deal with these symptoms. So like, you know, again, we think about physio as being like, I hurt my knee or my shoulder. How's yeah, physio working? Um, yeah. So, you know, when people think about, you know, going to a physiotherapy clinic, the very first thing they think of is exercise, you know, and uh, with this uh, group um, post COVID, we have to put it out there um, and remind folks that, you know, physiotherapists have uh, a myriad of skill sets different combinations of skill sets. So we're not just about ankle, uh, you know, ankle sprains and strains. Um, you know, for example, for me, I, I love to do the vestibular therapy and work with vertigo patients and patients who have dizziness. Not a lot of people know physios do that. Um, you know, so um, I, you know, you can definitely uh, come across a clinician uh, with, a, with a good underlying level of skills uh, that can definitely help your situation. Um, and realize that there really is no, uh, you know, cookie cutter approach uh, when it comes to these. Um, you know, as I as I uh, speak to a lot of my colleagues, um, COVID really does not have any rules as to how they affect people. Every there's no two clinic, uh, you know, clients who present the same. Um, and so, as much as we are evidence based uh, cl uh, clinicians and practitioners with a holistic approach. Um, I don't think I should have any rules as to how I take care of you either. I will use the, the tools that I have in my, um, in my chest to, you know, take care of you as best as I can. That's great. Rob, do you want to uh, jump in and, and maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, kind of anything else, I guess, to add about kind of what OT can do? Um, yeah, in, yeah, I think that I'm seeing a few of the questions come in as well, and I'll try to kind of uh, pick out a few answers for, um, for them. So really the, like from an occupational therapy standpoint, what I like to start off is, is find out what your current baseline is. And so we do a lot of, you know, we'll call it, um, I don't know, homework has a bit of a negative connotation. So we'll call it home practice, but really, you know, I'm looking at people doing some journaling for me. So, you know, I'm not following people around, like it's the Truman show, but I, you know, I require them to, you know, do some of the work to, track what it is they get up to in a day. You know, when are you going to bed? What time are you waking up? And it's a fact finding mission, right? It's a team approach. I'm gonna meet you halfway and we're gonna use that information to build your goals. So, you know, we start talking about tracking your activities but then we start to plan your activities. So what do you want from your day? And we start to go after things using almost like a points approach. So if you only have so many points to start off the day with, what do you wanna do with them? Knowing that, you know, normal everyday activities take a certain number of points. Those are non-negotiables. Okay, well, what do we do with the remainder? And if it's something that you want to do for, you know, our recreational or leisure activities, then fine, go, let's go after that. Or if you have, um, you know, you have a goal of, of improving your cognition, if that's an issue, then we use some of those points to go after some cognitive uh, remediation exercises. But if you also like to watch, I don't know, television at night or a sports event, or you want to do a Zoom call with friends, 
then we have to save some of those points. So it's a lot of this activity modulation and budgeting of time and energy for our lives because something we're finding out is that people are in this energy deficit or we're battling fatigue on this ongoing basis. But it's really about like, I don't know, this catchphrase of like skills for the job of living. That's what this is. Like that's what occupational therapy is about. And I mean, obviously, you know, um, in concert with the other um, allied health professionals on the team, but it's about getting back to doing life. And from a mental health side of things, a lot of people have heard, you know, talk about doing things like mindfulness or meditation practices, which sometimes has a bit of gets people's back up a little bit. But what I like to think about with that is, Let's, let's start talking about it in terms of maybe attentional training. Let's start working on just focusing our attention on the actual present moment without judgment. Be here right now. We're in this time where we're constantly being bombarded with information and we're constantly being blown out in terms of what's real and what's you know false information out there. But what about right here, right now? So like a lot of occupational therapists use a lot of mindfulness practices and, um, and you know, in, in some instances, some form of mindful meditation. Um, in order to help with sort of that, that calming approach or that centering approach. Um, we also look at motivational issues. So um, that's a question about that I saw come up of people talking about how do I stay motivated when I have these sort of crummy days? Well, similar to what Louisa was alluding to, reminding people of where they started and where they are now. And, and, and that's that activity tracking piece is saying like, this is our baseline. This is where we are now. You may have had a couple up and down days here, but you sure aren't back to where you were at baseline, right? So that's what we're kind of going for with occupational therapy. Again, we'll say, let's establish a baseline. Let's find out what your goals are. And then we take it and run with it. That's great. And, you know, I kind of hear you guys, and I love the analogy, Rob, about the, the bank account, you know, kind of thing, yeah. like, you know, and, and I used to use the analogy with my patients of, you know, riding the roller coaster, we got to stop riding the roller coaster, we can't go way too much and not enough and way too much and not enough is like trying to find that middle ground that's kind of just golden. 100%. So I know OTs are amazing at that. I know our, my physio colleagues are also amazing at that. So um, it doesn't really particularly matter what the diagnosis is. I think we probably all could benefit from some of that kind of uh, planning and pacing sort of thing. Um, so just as we're getting towards the end of the time, and, and I think we're covering a number of the questions, but I know we're not getting to them all. So those that have put questions in, please hang tight. We will send it a summary afterwards if we don't get to your questions. But one of the big ones that, you know, I think I see coming up and I know we want to talk about is what is this program all about? So, you know, just a little bit for everybody on the line here, um, you know, LifeMark um, identified the potential need for patients that you know, have had COVID or suspected to have had COVID, especially in those early days when there was no testing available um, for those individuals. We started seeing really early in the scientific literature coming out of Asia and Europe that these people were having, were going to need multidisciplinary rehabilitation. Um, and this is not unique for us. We, we see these sorts of people with many other different complex medical illnesses or injuries or conditions. And so we really started to watch the literature really closely and have continued to. So we were proudly able to launch a program in the middle of the summer last year, 2020, seems like so long ago. Um, but we offered some internal training to our staff to make sure that our clinicians were versed in these areas. They understood the implications of the disease on the body and what was happening and what we were seeing. And we're continuing to do updates with them because things are changing fast. And like everything with COVID, everything is changing day by day, sometimes minute by minute. So you know, we've put together this program and we've educated some staff about it. Um, and you're growing more and more of our locations, being able to take these clients. Um, but who is this program for? So some people said, you know, obviously I've had COVID, so I feel like I need to have this. Is there other people um, that should kind of have this come and attend for treatment? So I just saw in the comments um, here, uh, one uh, viewer logged in to say, I actually thought this program was to help the general population deal with the effect of what the COVID pandemic has on a person, not about individuals who are recovering from COVID. And so, you know, it was interesting to me because um, a, a lot of the times, you know, uh, clients will definitely come to us or, you know, the general public will come when there is definitely an issue. And, you know, as Rob is an OT, I'm sure, you know, I'm probably just setting you up so that you can speak about it. But even if those 
those who do experience like anxiety, um, you know, a bit of depression, um, this whole COVID thing is very overwhelming. Um, you know, uh, who's to say that you don't have to have COVID to seek these services. So indeed, this, this can also be like the caregivers for the clients who have had post COVID don't have COVID. Um, but they them too selves, uh, they also re could uh, could benefit from, you know, uh, a, a good bout of therapy. Again, that whole self care, you have to be able to take care of yourself before you can take care of somebody else. So this program is indeed, you know, it's always, it's always been there. Okay, so, um, uh, and we call it a, a program because, you know, the the whole the whole regime for somebody can be one discipline or it can be a multitude of disciplines that can help based on, you know, how you present to us. And so um, it, it generally can be for everyone. And a lot of the times, you know, we have to remember too that from the allied health professional standpoint, we are not specifically treating COVID. We're treating what COVID did, right? And the residual leftovers, your functional, you know, cognitive, mental and physical side of things. Uh, and that we have always been able to take care of clients, even without COVID. Um, so, you know, what does the program look like? Uh, you know, and as we say, it can be one discipline, it can be five disciplines, it can be one or two disciplines and, and not, you know, the frequency can be different based on your needs. That's great. Rob, do you have anything else you want to add in kind of about like who it's for, what it looks like, um, you know, who might be yeah. involved, any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think I think Louisa nailed nailed, you know, the, the majority of, of, you know, what I was going to say, actually, but that's um, <laughs> the big piece is looking at it virtually as well as in person. So recognizing, too, that, you know, depending on a multitude of circumstances, some people are not going to feel comfortable coming into a clinic environment at, at, for whatever reason. And that's that's fine. No judgment. And I have a great example of, of a person who was referred to us um, actually through their long term disability um, insurer that said, you know what, I, I can't even, you know, leave my house. I can't walk to the end of my driveway without needing a nap. So that's where I started. And we started with OT only. Um, in the beginning stages and the activity pacing and planning, and we did it all virtually, just like this. So we set up our on our encrypted, secure virtual care platform. We send you know unique codes and links to these uh, individuals, and we schedule our appointments. Um, I was seeing this person weekly, and we we built this individual up sufficiently that you know what he was able to walk around the block. He was you know got clearance to you know um, drive his vehicle safely because he had concerns about that. Um, and then, you know, we got him into the clinic. I still use the virtual care platform because that's what he wanted to do. He was more comfortable at disclosing a lot of his, his more personal mental health, cognitive issues and, um, in the comfort of his own home. But then he transitioned to doing what we'll call a hybrid model where he did his physiotherapy, um, uh, act, um, activation program with the kinesiologist and physio at our clinic. So it was a great, a great format and it's great to have that availability, um, and Absolutely. Yeah, it's just been I a also, great thing. Yeah, I also think that in, in the event that you do require another discipline, for example, I always use Ben in Ottawa because I know that he is a speech language pathologist in Ottawa. And, you know, I'm in Markham. And so being able to connect you, uh, you know, online with Ben for a treatment session um, is very easy. So you could be seeing disciplines, you know, across the country. We can, you know, easily attain that kind of discipline to help you as well. So it's not just limited to, um, you know, this day and age with the virtual is really nice because then you're not limited or confined within uh within one particular geographical location to get care um, absolutely yeah you know so when i think that um with the virtual the hybrid uh, model of care it's really nice and convenient for the patient too. Let's just say we do have an older client who's not very tech savvy at all, um, but we don't. We want to try to remove as many barriers as we can. So I, in fact, I can only speak for my clinic. I know lots of other clinics can have the space to do this, but what I will arrange to have done is a client can be even set up for their physio appointment in clinic. And then I will set them up with their laptop and connect them virtually with the occupational therapist or the speech language pathologist and provide them a safe space so they can stay, um, have their session and go. So uh, not only is it convenient for us to set you up, but it's a one, it's still considered a one-stop shop, yet you saw Ben in Ottawa, right? So 
so that's what makes it so amazing um, is that it, it sounds intimidating and very scary because, oh my goodness, it's going to be filled with all kinds of appointments. This is very overwhelming and stressful. You know, I don't know if I can handle seeing so many people at once. I'm not used to that. I don't know if I have the energy to do it. Definitely, we'll be able to, you know, paste those and spread them out, you know, as best as we can to make it convenient and so that you can, you know, get the best of your sessions and make it uh, as, you know, the least stressful as possible um, by removing those barriers for you. That's great. All right, guys, this has been amazing. And there's so many more questions still to cover. So we'll definitely be taking those away. Before everybody runs away, though, I do want to just take a minute and uh, collect a little bit of feedback from our attendees. I know some people have had to drop off. Um, but we have a couple of other polls that I've just put up onto your screen there to ask you to tell us a little bit about what you thought of the session. So before you sign off, please take a couple of minutes to tell us that. The other thing I know, Judy, our wonderful moderator has been uh, quick quickly and, and depthly uh, typing away with her fingers in the chat, putting in links and information on where you can find more uh, information or how to contact clinics or, or clinicians near you. Um, so I'm going to put up back up our slide that we had here that has um, how you can contact us should you require it, um, or you want to ask a few more questions specifically about where you live or um, the clinic closest to you. Um, again, we will take the questions that were a bit listed today and, and put them into a summary for everybody uh, to share that out. So just before we sign off, I want to thank both Rob and Louisa for sharing and coming and giving of your time today to talk to us, to share their, your expertise. Um, I truly value your uh, input, and I'm so glad we had the opportunity to connect with all the lovely people that we had on here today. So any final thoughts as we just collect our last few uh, polling responses? Uh, Rob, I'll let you go first, and we'll let the lovely Louisa have the last word. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was a, a pleasure being invited to uh, be part of the panel and, and um, you know, wish everyone all the best with, uh, with their recovery, if that's where they're at. Um, and, and if there's any other questions, you know, fire them in the chat and we can hopefully get to them uh, in future. I appreciate all your time. Right. Thanks, Rob. Louisa? Uh, I want to say thank you, Rob. I want to say thank you as well. I'm very proud to be a part of this gigantic team um, to be able to help um, all these, uh, you know, patients and people who need uh, care. Um, but the biggest thing is I want to commend the 120 people that have joined us. Uh, in addition to the, the folks that have left, um, I commend you for being here because, um, you know, whether you have COVID, had COVID, and you're dealing with your symptoms, or you're a caregiver, I, I did recommend one client to join us uh, because she was uh, advocating for her dad, um, and so she wanted to listen in. I'm very proud of everyone for being here um, because, you know, at this point now, um, you, you are, you know, digging deep down uh, to find a means to get better. Um, so I'm proud of you for joining us and you've made it this far. And I hope that you will give us the honor of helping you the rest of the way. Great. Thank you so much, Louisa. And again, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Judy. And thank you to all the rest of our team kind of behind the scenes for making this happen. Thank you also to all of our attendees for coming and joining us. So please come and reach out to us. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more information. We will circulate a link to the recording to all of our lovely registrants. So if you missed anything and you want to go back, you can check that out. And then along with some, reg uh, some uh, review of some of the responses to some of the questions we didn't have time for. So thank you so much again, everyone. Have have a lovely evening and have a great uh, day tomorrow and hopefully a sunny weekend wherever you are. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.